preservation, please go ahead and take the microphone. Thanks so much, Mike. Hi, this is Kristen from Heritage Preservation. And thank you so much for joining us today. Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community. And that includes um, these online webinars. And we're doing this project in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, Learning Times is helping us produce these webinars. And they've helped us produce the site as well. So we thank them for that. Um, again, the goal of the online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and to network with their colleagues. In developing the community, we drew on all sorts of resources that had been developed as part of the Connecting the Collections initiative, including the Connecting the Collections bookshelf, the uh, webinars, and workshops that we've and a whole series of, of actual online links that were part of what we call the Guide to Online Resources that was part of the bookshop project. Um, so you'll, you can um, go through the, um, the online community and find the topics screen that shows links to all of these wonderful resources. And we hope you do that. Um, today, we are featuring um, something that provided by the American Association for State and Local History. And it's their technical leaflets. For more than 40 years, AASLH has been regularly producing these technical leaflets on a range of topics that affect historical societies, historic sites, and history museums. And they're available at their website, which I've put up here on the screen. You can just click on their um, under Programs, Products and Publications, and then Technical Leaflets. And so um, you can see that. Um, there, and they're very inexpensive, uh, very low cost, and they're, they're bulk pricing. And today, we have um, made available um, the one of the technical leaflets. Yeah, you see it there. Um, our featured resource right now is the handling and exhibition of potentially hazardous facts in museum collections by Neil Cockerline and Melinda Markle. And uh, it's available right now. It's free of charge on our site. So there's no charge to look at this today. And it will remain up on um, the Connecting to Collections online community for free for a period of time. So that's um, we thank ASLH for making that available. And we encourage you to check out their website and the other technical leaflets that might help you in your work. Today, we are by Neil Cockerline, and we, he is the Director of Preservation Services and a conservator at the Midwest Art Conservation Center in Minneapolis. This is one of the country's regional conservation centers. And on the screen here, I've put their URL. They've got a lot of great resources and information about their services on their site. Neil has um, directed education and outreach programs since 1999 for the center. And they reach 180 members. Um, through their work, which include museums, historical societies, libraries, and archives from throughout the Midwest region. Neil consults on all aspects of conservation and preservation, including collection surveys, long-range preservation plans, disaster planning, emergency response, building, building projects for museums, and writing grants. In short, there's really nothing he hasn't seen. And he's on the road a lot going around to museums around the country. Prior to working in Minneapolis, he was a conservator in private practice and an associate conservator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And today, Neil will be answering your questions about handling and exhibiting potentially dangerous artifacts. And this can include a range of things. I'm going to just pull up a poll here um, so you can let us know what sort of things you might have in your collections that uh, concern you. And you can click all that apply. Let's make it bigger here. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and this is just a partial list, but you get a sense of, you know, from firearms and swords and knives to taxidermy um, to historic medicine bottles and medical equipment. It just can be a lot out there. So this will sort of give us a heads up on the sort of questions you might have. OK, we're seeing an arrange. I'll just keep this up a minute and give you a chance to answer that. OK. 
Great. Okay. So no ammunition and explosives. That's helpful to know. Um, but a little thing else. So hopefully we'll be able to answer all of your questions and concerns. And I'll just close this poll and move it away. Um, so thanks again, Neil, for joining us. Again, My everyone, pleasure. Yep. <laughs> Feel free, everyone, to just type, um, if you have a question, below the screen. And um, I guess I can get the conversation started with just a few came up on with. Um, you know, Neil, you've been around a long time in the preservation business, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of a lot of storage facilities and conditions. Do you want to just give us one example of a common type of hazardous collection that maybe an institution doesn't quite realize is as dangerous um, as you do? Absolutely. Um, I would say a lot of times, um, especially in historical collections, we run into collections that contain um, old medicines of various uh, dates and various types. And oftentimes, I think what is lacking is that many historical medicines um, either were identified by trade names or by common names. And the actual chemical makeup of the medicines um, oftentimes uh, is either unknown or, in some cases, may be completely ignored. And when we look at historical medicines, it's really kind of shocking to think at what our ancestors were using um, for medicinal purposes. A lot of times there were you know, things that we consider to be um, horribly poisonous today were quite commonly used. These things included arsenic, strychnine, um, and various other types of poisons. Uh, a lot of times there would be like um, mercury, uh, compounds that were used. And what a lot of people don't realize is that with time, when these medicines are left in their original containers, oftentimes the volatile components of the medicine will um, evaporate off. And oftentimes you're left with a very highly concentrated dose of um, basically a poison. And so it really becomes um, uh, problematic for people who have to handle these types of collections. They often feel like, well, as long as they're sealed in a bottle, we really don't have to worry about them. And that isn't really the case. Um, Oftentimes, it's probably best for any sort of residual medicines that are left in bottles actually to be removed, to be cleaned out. And usually, when one is doing an interpretive exhibit that contains medicines, it's not really the importance of the medicine itself. It's usually the container, which is of the most historic significance. So. Um, how to properly clean away these poisons becomes um, uh, a task that often is left to um, you know collections managers, et cetera. And so um, as a conservator and doing a lot of consulting, you know we often um, will consult on how do you remove these these various residues that are left in bottles and um, uh, if they're soluble in water, you can use just simply a water rinse. But once you resolubilize those medicines, what do you do with them? And so oftentimes what we recommend is to resolubilize whatever those particular medicines are, actually pour them out um, into a disposable container, let the, um, the liquid that you've added, 
then evaporate and whatever residue is left in the disposable container, if you're not sure, you really should take them to your local um, toxic waste site. In many um, county or city dump stations um, do have uh, the proper types of equipment necessary for taking um, toxic materials. And whenever you have a leftover medicine, um, you should consider it highly toxic, um, especially if you don't know what the particular components are. But even you know, common things like cough medicines, et cetera. Um, historically, many of those contain these, these rather startling poisons. And um, we have just an example here, a bottle that I found um, in a historic house that was used to, um, uh, it, you could rent it, the public could rent it for various activities. And in one of the bathrooms, um, they had an open, what we would call a medicine cabinet. You can see here there actually was a, a bottle of strychnine sulfate, which um, was used uh, historically as a medicine. Um, and again, you know, we it's hard to imagine that our ancestors were actually taking strychnine. But many poisons in very small doses um, wouldn't be uh, lethal. And so it's it's pretty amazing. I think one of the one of the things that really is lacking in a lot of the museum literature is um, actually having um, a pharmaceutical historian go back through and look at all of the various brand names and sort of household names for medicines and actually publishing what the actual chemical uh, components of those products were. I think many of us would be quite shocked to find out. Reference in the, um, the technical even that some of these medications include that are now illegal. Correct. So, and so that's another reason to make sure that the packaging is left intact, but but any any solids or any res residues are are removed. So then, um, should people take also other in doing that sort of gentle rinsing of bottles precautions like um, vinyl gloves, um, face masks. Absolutely. Anything like that. And, and then Absolutely. Maybe, and um, maybe even before beginning the project, have done their research on the toxic waste facility in their area and, and any requirements that that facility might have for, for accepting materials. Absolutely. And as much as possible, if you're going to clean out um, a medicine vial of some kind, and you're going to let whatever the the uh, solvent is, whether that's water or some kind of organic solvent, to actually remove the residue. You need to, as much as possible, you don't want to mix these residues together, number one, because you don't know chemically how they can react, mm -hmm. and number two, um, you want to label whatever that disposable container is. You want to label as best as you can from the original label on the medicine vial um, or bottle or container exactly what it is, even if it is just the commercial name and not the um, actual chemical name. Right. But you do want to turn that over to your toxic waste site so that they can deal with it appropriately. Right. Um, would this be something that potentially, if, if you had a university or college in your in your town and they had um, a chemistry lab, that you could potentially talk with them about maybe even doing this work in their lab, or they might have a fume hood, or or I mean, I don't. I'm sure the legalities in today's world that might have right. Being highly optimistic, but um, it just seems that if you're a smaller institution, you really are concerned that, that maybe that would be an option for for just getting some more opinions on the, on the Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other possibility would be to contact your local hospital. Okay, um, that's a good idea. 
and uh, oftentimes local hospitals um, are very willing to work with you, especially when they know it's some sort of historic medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, they're certainly uh, willing and able to help you dispose of it properly. And again, if for some reason you have certain types of um, medicines that are outlawed today, such as, such as opiate, um, marijuana, cocaine, etc. Many times in historic medicines, these were um, components of medicines because they weren't illegal at the time. But if you do have a controlled substance that today is considered an illegal drug, then it is best if you do take it either to your local police station or to your local hospital so that it can be disposed of. Um, otherwise, although it's not common, um, if you have some sort of medicine um, in a powdered form that happens to be, uh, you know, have a high concentration of cocaine um, within the, the medicine, um, the museum can be liable um, for uh, actually retaining that substance. So you do want to make sure that uh, for anything that's considered illegal today that it's properly disposed of. And in most cases dealing with law enforcement or with hospitals, um, you know, from your explanation, there's an understanding that you want to maintain the bottle. You don't necessarily want to retain whatever that medicine is. You would rather surrender it, in fact. And so usually um, those sorts of either law enforcement agencies or hospitals, which still may be um, using some of these uh, types of medicines as prescriptions. They will help you to dispose it, to clean it properly, and allow you to leave with um, your coveted container with the labels, et cetera, that you want to use for your exhibits or your interpretation. Great. So some, some questions we've gotten are, what if these are unlabeled contents? And is it probably just safe to assume you should treat it as if you know, perhaps it had been thrown away years ago and someone had put in some sort of a replica powder? But you should just probably safest to assume what, what you have could be original material, could be poisonous, and to treat it that way Absolutely. if it's an unlabeled container. Absolutely. If, if you're not sure what it is, you should empty it. Um, you should remove the residue. You should keep. You shouldn't mix. You should never mix um, different contents together. And then you should just take it as an unlabeled um, you know, medicine or an unlabeled substance. And if it's necessary, um, then uh, you know the the toxic site where you're taking it. Um, it's usually they can do a test to find out exactly what the contents are. Mm -hmm. But any sort of um, information that you can provide, even if you take the cleaned bottle with you and say, this is the bottle that it came out of, sometimes even by the design of the bottle or if it was an opaque bottle, et cetera, that can um, oftentimes give um, some information to sort of direct um, those sites that are taking this material on how they should uh, dispose of it. I mean, if you have something that's contained in an opaque bottle, chances are if it's um, left out in um, daylight, then there's going to be some sort of chemical change that takes place, and that they will want to know about. OK, those are great tips. So we've gotten a question for uh, from Rebecca. Um, uh, Cervolo, I think I'm saying that correctly, in, uh, in Alabama about possible radioactive mineral specimens. Any okay. suggestions on how they might begin to tackle that issue? Okay. 
Um, the first thing is if you have um, something that you suspect is being radioactive, um, the first thing you need to do is to actually do a measurement and to measure the radioactivity. And what you need is a Geiger counter. And most universities uh, in their um, science departments will have a Geiger counter. If necessary, you can take the specimen to them. Um, in some cases, they may send out a graduate student with the Geiger counter in order to do a test. Um, if you have something that is radioactive, um, you, of course, you want to treat that object very carefully. Now, there's sort of a distinction that is made between like a naturally occurring mineral, which may have some radioactivity to it, as opposed to um, something that has been constructed or has been processed that may have radioactivity involved in it. This can be anything from um, certain pigments to glazes in ceramics to things that were manufactured for um, uh, the military, for the space program, et cetera. Um, even though it's possible to, to do a calculation to find out what the half-life is, et cetera, of the material that you're dealing with, usually um, my recommendation is you really need to consider whether it's worth retaining this material within your collection. That's sort of the first question. Do we want to have to deal with all of the ramifications for actually keeping something that's radioactive within our collections? And this boils down to being able to um, protect your museum staff, your volunteers, et cetera. Um, and then the next question is, can we properly store this particular um, artifact, whatever it is, whether it's natural or, or whether it's a man-made artifact that uh, has radioactivity in it? You know, can we properly store it? And I'm not an expert in radioactive materials, so I can't really, you know, I can't say, oh, all you have to do is put it in a lead line box or put it in a steel box and then you're safe. I don't have that expertise. But if you were to determine that within your collection you do have radioactive materials, what I then would do would be seek out an expert in the field. And again, my recommendation would probably be going to a physics department at a major university and saying, we have this radioactive artifact. We have decided that we do want to keep it for research or interpretive purposes within the collection. How can we best store it? And I think with um, all of the information that's been in the news, especially the tsunami in Japan and what happened to the nuclear reactors there, and there have been descriptions of sort of these multi-walled steel containers that have, you know, cooling um, capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Storage of these types of materials is not just a simple factor. It's usually not as, as simple as we need a particular type of container. We can put this artifact in it. We can seal the top and then set it on a shelf. It's never that easy. So I think that um, if you you know your collection contains um, a material such as um, 
highly radioactive material, you really have to think about, is it worth maintaining this piece? And if we are going to maintain it, you have to do the research to find out how best to maintain it. The other thing on top of this is that most artifacts that exist in collections are kept for one or two re one of two reasons. It's usually for research or it's for exhibition. And so you think very, very you know, carefully about we have something that's radioactive, can we even exhibit it in such a fashion that's going to be able to protect our visitors? And again, we have to think, you know, a certain amount of radiation is going to affect, um, say, an infant or a young child very differently than um, an adult. So these are all questions that need to be asked and need to be sorted out. And oftentimes, um, I don't know, I think it's in my experience when I've, I've found radioactive things or explosives or um, really industrial poison, so on and so forth. When all of the consideration is done, it's usually easier, and the key word here, it's usually cheaper just simply to get rid of the offending material. Yeah, and one of the, another thing I think that a lot of people might have in their collection may not realize is so dangerous. I mean, there's household items like um, poisons, but uh, also cosmetics. I'm just trying to pull the slide here. Right. Um, and this is, as you can see on this slide, ammoniated mercury. Exactly. Um, and uh, kind of just like the medicines, a little bit scary to think people put this on their skin. Right. But uh, again, it can be something that people don't think of when it's you know in their collections. Um, the household poison slide. I think I'm going to pull up. But um, you had also brought up to me that it's even something is obvious. It says caution poison all over it um, on the fly paper. That um, it could be sort of in, in a good storage container or or safe. But you also have to be thinking of these items in your collection if you were to have a disaster happen. Absolutely. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? So you say you've made a decision to retain something that, that has a certain degree of hazard, um, hopefully not extremely hazardous to the public, but you know you made sort of certain precautions. But how might you think about that when thinking of you know, potential disaster situations at your institution? Absolutely. One of the things that I recommend is, when possible, if you have um, dangerous and toxic materials in your collection that you have decided to keep, is you certainly have to think about what happens during a disaster. Now, up on the screen, we have this um, poison fly paper. And if you first, anything that says poison on it, you want to make sure that you read very carefully all of the information you can about the product. In this particular case, I believe that this fly paper um, is to be kept dry. To activate it, you actually wet it. And it does contain arsenic. And so in this case, if you were to have, um, say, a flood in your building, and you had a stack of this fly paper, which I actually purchased this at an antique store in South Dakota. They had a stack of this stuff for sale, and I bought several of the containers because I wanted to use it as um, an illustration. And again, if this was something that you had in your collection, and you had a water event, say you had a pipe that broke, or you had a flood, and um, 
the fly paper actually was to fall into the water, you're then dealing with a level of toxicity that um, totally changes how your disaster response would um, be because you're no longer dealing with um, you know, dirty water or polluted water. You're now dealing with poisonous water. And so the first question is, would you want to subject yourself to this, let alone any volunteers, et cetera, et cetera? The same is true with first responders. If you have live ammunition in your storage vault, and luckily we didn't see any on the list, but if you have live ammunition or perhaps you have um, some sort of explosive that you're not even sure about, in the situation of a fire, all of a sudden um, the the danger could change immediately. I mean, live ammunition in a fire actually can shoot off. So you want to think about those people who are first responders. The last thing that I could ever imagine as a museum person would be causing the death of a first responder. And so I think it really is you have to think a little bit beyond your use of some of these um, different materials, but you have to think about the possibility of how they can affect others. So one of the things that I recommend is that if you have any dangerous or toxic artifacts, that you do keep them in a fireproof um, cabinet. And rather than spreading this stuff throughout your entire storage area, that you keep everything all together, that you label the outside of the cabinet and such and actually list what's in there, that part of your disaster plan, whoever the first responders are, whether it's the police, whether it's the fire department, that you already have notified those individuals that you do have some potentially dangerous things in your collection and that they are kept in a very specific area. Usually I recommend you keep them right inside the door to your storage area so that depending on the conditions that the first responders meet, they can make uh, an educated decision on whether they even want to enter that particular room. And so I think this also causes museum staff to think, well, gee, if they're not even going to enter the storage room because we have this cabinet of dangerous and toxic things right inside the door, maybe we need to reconsider if we don't want to lose the rest of the collection and storage, maybe we really need to reconsider whether it's necessary to even keep these types of objects in the collection. And again, there are many types of historical objects that, um, you know, the chemistry involved just is not very well known. Now, one of the things, and Kristen, I'll let you find this slide, is there used to be these glass containers that were used for um, putting out fire. And many Many people believe, and here's an example of one, this is sort of a clear glass, clear um, uh, solvent in it. Many people, you know, for the longest time have thought, oh, that's just water that's in that, and you would take this glass container filled with water, throw it on a fire, and it would put out the fire because of the water, when in fact the actual chemical inside of these glass 
fire extinguisher bombs, as they were called, is actually carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is um, a very toxic solvent. It used to be found um, uh, quite commonly in dry cleaning, but it was outlawed by the EPA, and this was some decades ago. But um, again, these as historic objects, they are they contain an extremely toxic solvent in them. And carbon tetrachloride has been proven um, to be an agent that causes various types of cancer, but especially um, liver cancer. So again, you know, a question is, do we want to retain um, these types of materials, especially if they're going to put, number one, people at risk, and number two, other parts of the collection at risk? I think that it really takes some serious consideration of um, how we're going to um, maintain these types of artifacts. Now, I know by looking at our list of participants that we have some people from art collections um, who have joined with us. And believe it or not, um, there are a lot of materials found in artworks that are quite toxic. Um, if we look at particular types of pigments, um, a good example would be vermilion which is sort of a historic red vermilion oftentimes was used in Renaissance paintings. And we go, OK, we've all heard of vermilion. It's a red pigment. But what a lot of people don't realize is that chemically, what is vermilion pigment? Well, it turns out it's actually mercuric sulfide. And when mercury burns, it actually gives off um, an extremely toxic gas that one breath um, can kill an individual. And so art collections also can contain very toxic things that people don't even think about. I remember doing an exhibition of the work of Sigmar Polka when I was in San Francisco at the Museum of Modern Art. And he did this installation where he had assistants grinding up historic pigments in egg whites and then painting these huge domes that were in the old building where the Museum of Modern Art had resided for decades. He had chosen vermilion. He had chosen Rialgar, and he had chosen Orpiment, all historic pigments. Well, after the show, um, our prep staff was told to go in and wash off this egg residue with these ground pigments in them. And I just about blew a gasket because they were started with the yellow orpiment, and nobody realized at the time, except for the conservation staff, that orpiment is actually arsenic sulfide. And I walked in when they just had started. They had buckets of water with scrub brushes and gloves on. But they literally were covered in this yellow pigment, trying to scrub it off of the walls. And again, here, you know, basically our prep staff is in an arsenic, um, uh, you know, bath. And so we immediately stopped that, you know, we, we took uh, the two individuals and we actually took them um, to hospital so they could be properly cleaned, et cetera. And then we ended up um, using um, oil paint to actually paint over these huge domes that had all of this powdered poison in them. And so 
um, you know, you're, you're, I think many of us become um, sort of, uh, what's the word I want? Um, you know, we just feel that these things that we're handling every day, um, we don't realize sort of chemically and physically the dangers that they may impose. And I think that that's something that we really have to pay attention to. And I know that in a lot of my consulting, when I'm dealing with institutions who are doing collection inventories, you know, I, I really try to um, instill in them the need for identifying chemically materials that are contained in different artifacts. And then when you know there are dangerous components that you do consider deaccession, um, that you do consider if they are key to the collection and you want to keep them that you package them in such a way so that somebody who may just walk in off of the street or a volunteer who may be going into storage to select a particular artifact and yet they choose the wrong thing or whatever, that you actually do everything you can to protect not only the staff, but the public from these various materials. And when you're considering putting things on exhibition, that also can be, um, you know, you have to take into account, you know, is there any possibility that this could affect um, a member of the public? And I think if it's OK, Kristen, I'm going to sort of transition here into taxidermy specimens. Yeah, that was my next question, because that's the situation. Taxidermy and ethnographic artifacts are, are very, very common, very, very central to a lot of institutions' mission, and yet have so many challenges. Absolutely. Um, and one of the biggest things, um, and this includes ethnographic artifacts, but it's a little bit different. Taxidermy, when it originally was done, <clears throat> um, and this is historically the way taxidermy was done, but then we have to question, well, what is actually a historic practice? Originally, in order to preserve the skins and hides of taxidermy animals, um, the, the chemical that was used was actually powdered arsenic. And it was mixed with water and actually whipped into sort of a froth. And this froth was painted onto the skins of animals. It was allowed to dry, and then the skins, which still had um, some of the moisture, they weren't allowed to completely dry, but the skins then with that moisture and the arsenic could be fit over an armature and um, fastened into place. Now, that's considered a historic practice, but in reality, um, we have seen taxidermy specimens that retain this arsenic practice even into the 1970s. And so we generally use a cutoff date of 1980. Even though taxidermy is not controlled or licensed in any sort of way, and I'm still convinced to this day that somewhere out in the hinterlands of North Dakota or Montana or Wyoming, there is somebody doing taxidermy who has been doing it for the last 50 years. And somewhere in their shop, they have a 55-gallon drum of arsenic that they're still using the traditional um, method of whipping up an arsenic froth and applying it to skins of animals. 
So I, I always approach every taxidermy specimen with a big question mark. Is this toxic or not? Chances are, if a taxidermy specimen was prepared before 1970, chances are it is laced with arsenic. And so um, this is something that is, of, uh, to me, an especial concern, because um, as taxidermy animals begin to age, uh, Many times the arsenic will filter out either through seams or uh, through the skin itself, and um, you can end up beginning to see arsenic on the surfaces of these types of artifacts. And so any time I go into a museum, whether it's very large or very small, and I see taxidermy animals that are not well protected from the museum going public, I always get extremely nervous and try to relate to those who are making the exhibition decisions to, number one, make sure they have tested their taxidermy specimens for arsenic. If they contain arsenic that they're taken off of exhibition, they should only be shown in totally sealed cases, and those cases should never be opened. If you have a historic taxidermy specimen in a totally sealed case that never comes out, you're probably going to be all right. That is until there's a disaster. Again. If you have a flood and the case breaks, all of a sudden you're going to have arsenic in the flood waters. If there is a fire and the arsenic begins to burn, burning arsenic is extremely toxic. Again, you have to think about the first responders. Um, so taxidermy, to me, is really questionable. Now, if you have historic taxidermy specimens, I think it's important to actually do a test. And um, there are arsenic uh, testing um, kits that are available through many of the chemical manufacturers. And um, you can, in some cases, if there is a white powder on the surface, you can take some off very carefully and do a test for the presence of arsenic. If you have any sort of taxidermy specimen that is out on exhibit and you don't know when the piece was prepared, how long, um, if it's been in the collection since before 1980, you simply have to um, make a judgment that that particular specimen probably has arsenic in it. To um, make a judgment call of any other stripe would definitely be a mistake. Now, we also have seen with ethnographic collections, which include Native American artifacts, as well as various other African artifacts, um, Pacific Island artifacts, et cetera. Many of those artifacts that were collected by public or even museums outside of those original um, uh, peoples. Oftentimes, these types of artifacts also have had pesticides applied to them. In the, at the turn of the century, um, into the 20s, 30s, even up until the First World War, oftentimes that included dusting with either powdered arsenic or powdered strychnine. Um, other types of uh, 
chemicals were also used. But again, um, one has to be very, very careful. Here is where provenance becomes really important. And there are new technologies available to do testing for these types of poisons, especially arsenic. But if, say, you received a collection um, from a non-Native American um, and it embodied 200 uh, artifacts. And you're now wondering, gee, should we test some of those artifacts? Should we test all of the artifacts? Basically, in a scenario such as this, you can choose some um, sort of key pieces to test. Those pieces that have leather, that have feathers, that have quill work, are usually the likely candidates for having been treated with pesticides. If you treat a group of objects and you find even a single object that has a positive test for arsenic, you have to consider until individual testing is done, you have to consider that the chances are likely that the full collection had been treated with either you know, some sort of pesticide or um, in some cases, it, it may be an antifungal agent. And arsenic was used for both. So again, um, you have to be very, very careful when you're dealing with ethnographic items. Something that we also see quite often is with the repatriation of especially Native American artifacts. And many smaller museums don't understand sort of the philosophy that Native Americans had concerning their artifacts. We had a group of Native Americans who visited our lab um, during this past week. And um, it was very interesting because I wanted to confirm um, something that had always sort of been a rumor. And two of these people were from different Native American tribes and spoke different languages. And I asked them, you know, my understanding is that most, if not all, Native American languages do not have a word for art. And indeed, they confirmed that. And it's sort of very interesting because we had a discussion about how things that have now landed in collections across the United States, across the world, um, that are Native American, is that the Native American peoples believe that their objects, that their artifacts, were actually living spirits. And so the very idea that someone from outside of their own people would be applying a poison in order to protect the longevity of um, their artifact, they find that um, almost overwhelming. It's um, like someone outside of their peoples was actually poisoning the artifact in order to kill its living spirit. And so we run into all kinds of problems today when things are repatriated back to tribes. And in many cases, um, the types of artifacts that are being repatriated have a special um, spiritual significance or religious significance. And in many instances, the, the original tribes want to be able to use these artifacts in their spiritual or religious ceremonies. And so it really becomes this quandary, I believe, for the non-Native American um, uh, 
collections people that we have to be really, really careful about how we treat their artifacts in this day and age. We need to find out as much as possible what the provenance and what the previous treatment of these artifacts were, especially if they're going to be returned to the native tribes. Again, it's sort of like my feeling that any museum person would never want to see a first responder lose their life because of a mistake that they themselves made or that the museum made. And I think it's also true of repatriating items. You know, the last thing we would want to see would be someone using the item in its original um, context and end up poisoning that individual. So that's a, that's a good point. Thanks, Neil, for for that. I wanted to get to Lisa in Brookings, South Dakota's question okay. about um, with ethnographic materials that may have had pesticides. What kind of best practices should they use in handling that? I mean, getting that into a closed vitrine or storage. Again, should those materials that have either questionable provenance or have been positively tested, they should they be stored together, much in the same way you talked about other hazardous collections? And then what kind of, you know, would that help sort of in, in sort of labeling them so that, you know, I mean, obviously I think uh, a, a good best practice is, is for, for them to be, for all storage areas to have sort of restricted um, access and, and, you know, so that volunteers aren't necessarily just wandering in and out. Um, for a variety of reasons, not just hazardous collections materials, but but what yes. sort of tips on what t sort of tips on so you, so you know what you have and you know that they're they have a certain level of danger. What sort of storage and handling tips might people have? And then I just want to tell the group um, we just have a few more minutes left. So if you have a last question, put it in the Q and A box now. Okay, uh, go ahead. Neil. Um, well, for Lisa. Brookings, I know Lisa very well, and I know that she and her group of volunteers have um, built individual storage containers for everything in their Native American collection. Um, their history of dealing with their collection is um, quite amazing, and she's to be congratulated for that. I think um, certainly uh, you want to be careful about handling them. You always want to, as much as possible, wear gloves, wear proper respirators, especially if there's any sort of powdery residue that you can see in a storage box, if it's been uh, sitting on a shelf, if there's any sort of powder. Um, surrounding the artifact, you certainly um, you know want to take notice of that. You always want to be very careful about handling any item that may be questionable as to whether some sort of previous um, preservative has been added. So indeed, you do want to handle things with gloves. We usually recommend using nitrile gloves. Um, Cotton gloves are not good protection, simply because any sort of powdered um, poison or pesticide can uh, permeate those gloves and end up on your skin. Even with thorough hand washing, et cetera, it's better to use a nitrile glove, which um, any sort of powder cannot penetrate. When you remove the glove, you should bag them and um, take them to, uh, again, a toxic waste site. Um, but for, um, for storage and exhibition, if you have something that you know has been dusted with a poison, it's probably best to make both a storage container and an exhibit container um, to 
completely house the individual artifacts so that, number one, you don't have to touch it, number two, so that the, the exhibition um, case can also be used to store the item, and you basically never have to open that case. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, well, we didn't get to address um, firearms or weaponry today in today's webinar. Um, and I think based on the poll we did at the beginning, um, that, that we didn't see a lot of, um, a lot of people with the, on today's webinar that had that question. But just in case someone's listening to this on archive later, um, perhaps that's a top special topic that we could address in a separate webinar. But I wanted to thank Neil again for your time today. and. This interesting and very useful information. And again, it will be, it's been recorded and it will be access, accessible on um, the website probably the next day or two. And, and so we've and also found in the, uh, the topic section of the, um, of the website. So if you have a colleague that you think would benefit from the information shared today, please do pass it along to them. And, um, I have put up a URL to our evaluation in the Q&A section, if you don't mind cutting and pasting that into your browser and letting us know what you thought, and particularly what topics would be of interest and use to you in your work. Um, coming up, we will do our best to address them in future webinars. So thank you again, Neil, for your help today. And uh, we look forward to joining you on our next webinar in a few weeks. Thanks again.